evening, everyone. My name is Mok Laing. I am a map enthusiast. I have been asked by NLB and Mr. Taylor himself to introduce him tonight. Um, uh, it's a long story. Um, back in 1999, I started researching the history of surveys and mapping in Singapore, uh, more or less as part of work and subsequently as part of my hobby. So I've been doing that since then. And by 2006, I reached the stage where I uh, went into the research of using air photos, photos taken by aircraft, to draw maps. This was a technology that was uh, adopted after the Second World War for mapping of Singapore and Malaya. So I went online uh, to search the web for any information about a particular squadron that was printed on old photo maps, that means maps based on photographs of Singapore. And there was one squadron that was mentioned on those maps, and it is just 81 PR, 81 PR squadron as printed here on the, on the slide here. So I searched the web and I found a particular website. It was actually a commercial website. Uh, someone has put it on the web. At that time, the, the web was not so uh, uh, sort of filled with information on everything. And nowadays, Google likes to claim that there's almost nothing that's not there. But I only found that website and there was a link, an email to 81 Squadron, um, sort of a member associ association and something like that. So I wrote to the email address and surprisingly someone replied. Uh, and uh, very enthusiastically uh, answering all the questions that I asked about the aircraft type that was used. And then I realized that the, the squadron, as usual with military establishment, there were different uh, divisions of labor. And most of them were aircraft uh, technicians uh, that replied. And um, I only got certain type of information. My information is more on the uh, air photography and how they take the photograph, the technical aspects of taking photograph. There's a particular way of taking photograph for use in mapping purposes. And uh, eventually I corresponded uh, with the member of the 81 squadron uh, for a few months. Then of course it, the thing died off uh, as national, naturally. And two years later in 2008, I got a surprise email. Uh, at that time I was doing other parts of the, my research, uh, focusing on other areas because the 81 squadron sort of died off. Then one fine day, I received an email, and it's, it's from Australia this time around, it's south of the equator. And the email was sent by Mr. Al Taylor, speaker for this evening. And he said that he's from the squadron, and he will be visiting Singapore in the later part of the year. And would, would I like to meet up with him? And uh, he can answer anything in person. It's much better than over email or to, through the uh, telephone. So eventually the day came, and... Uh, I exchanged particulars with him. How tall are you? And uh, that sort of thing. Uh, what I'd be wearing, that sort of thing, because I never met him before. Yeah. And uh, eventually, yeah, in, at the hotel, which is over there, you can see Golden Landmark. Now, I think renamed to Village Landmark or something. Yeah. So we met for the first time in 2008. <laughs> that was uh, yeah, seven years ago. And almost every year, L. Taylor has been uh, visiting Singapore with his wife, Yvonne. See over there. <laughs> Uh, except for one year, I think 2011. So every year we have been meeting and we have this little gathering in Singapore. And you know, we found several ex member of the squadron and they are Singaporeans. And that's a surprise uh, finding for myself. They are Singaporeans who serve in the Royal Air Force, proper Royal Air Force, not the uh, auxiliary air force of the Malaya, uh, MAAF. Uh, and um, I got to know some of the photographers through this association and that answered my, the technical questions that I've been looking for over these years. The, how they took the photographs, what sort of cameras they used, what sort of flying height and the technical aspects. And one of the, the maps, um, for the last six months, there was a major ex map exhibition downstairs on the 7th floor, 11th floor. Two of the maps show this uh, race course and the Bukit Brown area. And uh, one of the members of the squadron was the photographer on that mission to take the photograph used in that map series. <laughs> so to me, it's a then, wow, small world phenomenon. And he was sharing with me how, how the, uh, they took the photographs. But he's a royal engineer uh, personnel. The, the engineers were doing the maps. The squadron took photographs. And this is the significance of this uh, relationship, a working relationship. And he is a member of the squadron's uh, association. So he was telling me how they did the thing and so on and so forth. And in that series, if you pay attention, the series numbers, uh, the map sheets, there are two sheets missing. And in one of the photographs this, this gentleman sent me, he was holding up one of those missing sheets because two of the sheets were censored. Uh, those covered the, 
uh, at that time, uh, because it was the Malayan emergency at that time, so there was a uh, wartime kind of uh, situation, so some of the areas cannot be shown. And after all these years, we don't get to see that two missing sheets. The, the numbers, there's a gap. Two numbers are missing. So that's my story of uh, getting to know the squadron initially and uh, subsequently to meet Mr. L. Taylor. So without further ado, let me <laughs> invite Mr. L. Taylor to give the talk this evening. Part of um, what I want to do is to, first of all, excuse me, just set the scene a little bit. And I want to read out something that you may be a little bit puzzled why I've read this out, but I think you'll understand as we go on. This is called the principles of war. Don't get frightened. What are called the principles of war, though they can be simply stated, are not easy to learn and can never be learned from books alone. They are the principles of human nature and whoever learned from books how to deal successfully with his fellow's war, which drives human nature to its last resources, is the great engine of education, teaching no lessons which it does not illustrate and enforcing all its lessons by bitter penalties. One of the notorious principles of war familiar to all who have read books about war, is that a merely defensive attitude is a losing attitude. This truth is as true of, as it is of games and boxing, or of traffic and bargaining as it is in war. Every success, successful huckster is thoroughly versed in the doctrines of the initiative, which he knows by instinct and experience, not by reading of learned treatises. A man who knows what he wants and means to get it is at a great advantage in traffic with another man who is thinking only of self-defense. Every successful boxer is an expert in military science. He tries to either weaken his adversary by repeated assaults on the vital organs or to knock him out by a stunning blow. He does not call these op options by the learned names and strategy and tactics, but he knows all about them. The most that a book can do for the trader or boxer or soldier is to quicken perceptions and prepare the mind for the teachings of experience. The experience of war from, being, from beginning to end taught the old lessons of the supreme value of the offensive. Now your late great Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, I think, encapsulated those words when he said that he wanted Singapore to be extremely successful and prominent in the world. But most of all, he wanted it to be able to defend its, its virtues. And if anybody was to attack Singapore, they would end up with a bloody nose. That is engrossed in what I've just read to you. Now that was an excerpt from a book I've just read. My wife went out <coughs> and she hunts through looking, we both love books, and she went to a library sell, sell out that was selling all the old books. And in there, she picked up two volumes of six. They were written by a fellow called Sir Walter Raleigh, not the noted Walter Raleigh of hundreds of years ago, but this was done in the 20s. And he was the author of The War in the Air, and that excerpt I've just read you out was from page 370, volume one of six. I've only got two volumes, unfortunately. It's a very, very detailed account of the beginning of air supremacy as it is today, right from the very start. Now into this comes codes of engagement. And I'll go into this a little bit further on when I talk about the riots in Singapore while I was here. The objectives achieved by different styles. You can achieve greatly in life and have a different style to somebody else. And I don't mean to be detrimental to anybody, but I'm going to mention three names now. Two of them I would have worked with and one I wouldn't. They were great generals. One was a fellow called Patton. One was a fellow, well, a fellow called Field Marshal Montgomery and the other one was Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Now, two of those gentlemen were the sort that led by example, 
The other one was a person that led by a little bit more of a direct approach, which I didn't particularly like, or I wouldn't have liked. So at the end of the day, you can achieve your objective, and there are different ways of achieving it. I just happened to have been associated with 81 Squad, and we achieved our objectives, but we did it by willingness. And I'll again go on further about that as I progress. Now, I'm also heavily involved in Australia in a military support group called the RSL, Returned Servicemen's League, and it supports um, both serving soldiers, their families, or so, um, sorry, service people and their families, and also um, veterans. But also we look after schools and children because we always want to educate them to respect the sacrifice sacrifice that gives you the freedoms that you have today. Please don't take your freedoms for granted. Somebody had to sacrifice something for them. And it wasn't the doctor, it wasn't the lawyer, it wasn't the, the newspaper editor, it wasn't anybody else other than the veterans that have given you the freedom that you have today. And I'm proud to have been part of that. And if you can imagine all of the beaches in Australia, and there's 37,000 kilometres of beaches in Australia, I'm just merely one grain on all of those beaches. So I'm, uh, I'm nothing. Later on, we're going to do a little thing called the Ode. And at the end of that, this is just a non-sectarian, non-religious little thing that we do so that we just clear, cleanse our minds and think about those that gave the sacrifice. They could have been your ancestors. They could have been your friends. They could have been civilians. They could have been in the military. You'll see me put my hand up here, there. Traditionally, there are people in the world that put their hand on their heart to show support of the country and so forth. I'm not doing that. I'm there paying respects to my mates, probably people I never met, probably people that died on their own. What I'm doing is covering my medals because my medals are insignificant compared with their sacrifice that they gave. So, let's move on. I've got a lot to get through. <sighs> the origins of flight. Just very, very basically, I'd like to go into that and give you some idea of flying, rather, and how flying was first perceived, because, what have we got on the screen now? Let me keep up with it. Oh, yeah, okay, we'll come to that in a moment. Okay, it's well known in the military that the leader with the best information or intelligence is the strongest, he's the most powerful. So to gain this information, uh, you need to be able to identify what the, where the enemy are, what their strengths are, what they're up to and so forth. And this used to be done by just getting up to a high point, gradually rising up from the top of a hill, or the top of a tree or something like that. Then gradually it moved on that people started getting up a little bit higher and they found out about hot air balloons and things like that, or balloons, so they just raised them up and there would be a little basket underneath and they would then look down over the enemy and they could send, direct the artillery. Or they could say, wait a minute, they're reinforcing that left flank, we need to get over there to, to cover that or something like that. So this was the intelligence that they needed. This is how the intelligence progressed and began to become um, collected. Things like Troop in the Colour, if you've ever watched those programs where they troop the colour in the UK or they do it in other countries and so forth, that basically at the end of a day's battle was the idea to address the situation of how many troops we've got left and how's that regiment doing and how's that, that battalion doing etc etc. So it was an idea at the end of the day so that the, 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 uh, the Lord or whoever was, was running the battle etc could look down and see how his, his um, future was doing, etc. So he's going to see where all his troops are, see how depleted that squadron was, or that battalion. Now the first powered flight, notice I said powered flight, was in 1848, and that was by a fellow called John Stringfiller, who built, he's an Englishman, and he built a little model, and believe it or not, it was, it was powered by a little steam engine. So that was the first powered flight. And from that developed 
various other versions, and then in 1903, on the 17th of December, Orville Wright performed the first actual powered manned flight. From then on, there were a lot of um, attempts to make uh, progress, and that then materialised in the First World War, where in actual fact, the aircraft was not designed as a fighter or anything else other than just for observation. That's all it was. And it was only as time progressed that the pilots or the air crew used to take up with them a revolver and then they start taking a pot shot at somebody else and then it was a rifle, then it was a machine gun and then they started to develop how these things would operate and so forth. So it gradually developed into something more than just um, intelligence into the fighters that we know. But basically, flying started off purely and simply for observation. Uh, so now we've got um, Google and satellites. So we've, we've understood the principles of war and the preparedness now. Um, the, F, the RAF was actually formed in 1918. Prior to that, it was known as the Royal Flying Corps. And a lot of that was uh, the, the people, um, ex-officers from the army. And originally, there was a theory that to be a pilot in the, uh, in the Royal Flying Corps, you had to come from the cavalry. Because the coordination between hand and feet was exactly what you required for flying. So that's what originally where they first started coming from. Uh, then they started to develop uh, the technical trades and, the tradition, and then they developed a tradition of precision including radio telephony, second to none and envied by others in program maintenance with many checks and balances to avoid mistakes and accidents to maintain a very high standard of safety. Measure twice, cut once. That's the old carpenter's theorem to make sure that you don't stuff up a decent piece of timber. So the Royal Air Force um, was started in 1918, on the 1st of April. Yes, that's April Fool's Day. But believe you me, in my book, the Royal Air Force has become a senior service. Now to support this, I get a lot of barbs from the Army about this and the Navy. But let's just experience, let's just visit this field. The Royal Air Force is young but it is still in my book, The Senior Service, because 1941, 1940 rather, the uh, Battle of Britain was fought. Now just imagine the world map if the Battle of Britain had gone the other way and Germany had actually succeeded in aerial supremacy. Because if they had it done, they would have walked all over the UK because without aerial supremacy, you are a dead duck. That was proved in Singapore many years later when the Air Force failed miserably, mainly because of extremely poor management by the British. I have no hesitation in criticising them because there was far too many chiefs and not enough Indians and there was far too many little wars being fought internally and empires being built, unfortunately. So if the Battle of Britain had gone the other way, Germany would have taken the UK. They would have taken Ireland. That means then that the Western Desert would almost certainly have fallen to the Germans as well because we wouldn't have been able to support that. So by doing that, the Germans now had a, a, a direct route right the way through from Germany, down through Europe, across the water, through North Africa, and straight across to South America where they already had uh, a strong network of, of operations over there. Then there would have been a quick run up the, up the mainland and they were on the door, knocking on the door of America. Now I'm not saying that they would have beaten America but I'm just saying that the whole world could have changed. So please stop and think when I say the Royal Air Force is the senior service. And you can say, well, the Air Force is a senior service because there is no army or navy in this world now that can exist without aerial supremacy. So much so that the army now, particularly in Australia and in the UK and in America and other countries, 
the army have got their own flying units because that, that's how serious aerial support is, aerial supremacy. So, very, very quickly, um, due to the 1920s, due to the tensions with Japan's rumblings about their position in the far, sorry, this one's getting on the blink as well, um, the British government searched for a Singapore air base. Now, originally, it wasn't a land base. It was a flying boat base. So that was off the north coast of Salita, where the flying boats, we found, it was found that the waters there were ideal for flying boats. So that's how Salita was first established as a flying base on the water. The flight from the UK to Australia was very long, very troublesome, because aircraft weren't terribly reliable in those days. And there weren't that many airfields between the UK and Australia. So to get out there, you could do it by uh, normal uh, land air, airfields, but there weren't many of them. And it was a problematic journey. Whereas with flying boats, they could fly along, lovely little bay down there, let's just land on there, and we'll draw out the little pontoon, and we'll have a barbecue, and then we'll start up the engines and we'll fly off. And basically, because of the rumblings with um, uh, Japan and so forth, it was considered that we needed to do something out here because the British Empire, as you'll probably appreciate, existed everywhere in the world that was pink. The only problem was that many years later, when the balloon went up and the Second World War started, the British Navy, which was the largest in the world, was stretched too damn far. Same as their army and their air force, so something had to give. And if you look at all of the areas that the Royal Navy was covering at the time, that's the northern approaches, which went round from the UK, up round the north and round to Murmansk and northern Russia, north, and, north Atlantic, South Atlantic, Mediterranean, Red Sea, Indian Ocean, Pacific. Couldn't do it all. When it was a case of, oh, a little bit of a skirmish out there, we'll send a couple of um, gunboats out there, that'll sort it out. Those days were over. That's why Singapore was left in the lurch for that period of time, because we got too damn stretched. So 1928, Salita became the first RAF base in Singapore, and it was a sea-based base. In 1930, West Camp was developed from a, from a swamp, and that actually had that short runway that was in there. So Salita became the first land-based Air Force base in Singapore. It preceded every other base. 1930, oh yes, 1930, oh yes, and uh, this, this was this precursor to Kalang, by the way, but um, Charlie Chaplin was one of those notorieties that actually flew into Salita. Uh, the American um, comedian. So 1930, the defense of Singapore was at arm's length from Westminster. 1940, the Battle of Britain. Bomber Command actually went on the offensive after the Battle of Britain because the British Army and Navy or the Commonwealth Army and Navy, whichever way you wish to look at it, didn't have the power to be able to take on the offensive. So it was Bomber Command that went on the offensive, and they started raiding Germany. The next lucky thing that happened was that a fellow called Bomber Harris was appointed as the director of Bomber Command, and he certainly went on the offensive. Criticised widely, but necessary. You could not stop the approach by just standing back and being defensive. You had to be offensive. Now probably that little spiel that I read earlier on will begin to make sense to you. You have to become offensive. So 1941, regrettably, the Japanese 5th Division landed at Patani and Songhai in Thailand. Invaded Malaya via, via Kedah. The 18th Division land coasted on the coast of Kota Baru. They had determination. They had flexibility. And a lot of their speed was on bicycles. <laughs> the old-fashioned push bike. 
and they took us by complete surprise. Now that was mainly because there were very few defences in Malaya and the officer that had been sent over in the 30s to plan the, de the defences in northern Malaya and so forth was not allowed to do what he suggested. He was the expert, no, nah, wasn't being done because there was too much infighting between the bureaucrats, the politicians, the, uh, the, the tin pot leaders and everybody else, etc. There was about a half a dozen people and there was a very weak leader called Percival who couldn't take control. So the, the Japanese just walked through everything. They outsmarted them because everybody said, they'll never get tanks down there, they'll never do this, they'll never, they'll never get through the jungle. Well, they didn't need to, they just came down the roads. But even in the jungle, they outwitted, they outflanked. We just were not ready for it. It was very poorly organised from the British point of view. Much to the um, displacement of Singapore and Malaya, by the way. Uh, so, 1942 became the fall of Singapore. Ensuing cruel and inhuman occupation. It saddened me greatly, my wife, we went along to Uttram Park because I wanted to see, I'd read so much about, and I, I read avidly, but I'd read so much about Uttram Park, which was the most feared jail in Singapore by civilians and military. And the one thing that the Kempi Thai did not want, because Uttram Road was run by the Kempi Thai, they didn't want people to actually die before they had completed their sentence. So if it got to the stage where they were dramatically seriously ill, whip them off to Changi for a while. Now, Changi was bad enough, but it was nothing compared with Uttram Park. That was massively, massively cruel. And I won't go into all the details, but there's enough books out there for you to read, so stop playing with your thumbs and start reading books. <laughs> because you have a plethora of, of history and the things that went on and the, and the way that people got through and it was only because these people, these prisoners were determined. The ones that had the most determination were the ones that stood the better chance of survival. So in life, it is exactly the same. If you don't want to do something, guess what? It ain't gonna happen. And there's only one person on the face of this earth that can actually willingly tell you exactly what to do. And that person is yourselves. I'm constantly telling children at school in, the U in Australia. There's only one person, so knuckle down, attend to your schoolwork, achieve the results, because you ain't going to go anywhere unless you do achieve your results. So by 1945 came the Japanese surrender. And the British came back into Singapore and Malaya. And the Japanese uh, surrender was signed in a ceremony held at the Municipal Hall Building, now the City Hall. British troops returned to Singapore, and then in 1946, or at the same time, 1945-46, 81 Squadron had actually, its record had been that it was formed in 1917 at a place called Gosport in the UK, and it sort of muddled around for a long time. Didn't do much, it was a communications unit. Then in 1939, it was formed into a fighter squadron. 1940, it was then put on um, a converted Italian liner that had had a deck welded on the top of it. And there were 19 hurricanes on top and the rest of them were down below in packing cases. So 135 and 81 Squadron formed 142 Wing and they sailed off from Glasgow. Having pre been loaded up with KDs, which gave the German spies the impression that it's gonna turn left when it goes out of Glasgow and it's gonna head down towards the Middle East and it's gonna support the, the fight in the Western Desert. Instead of that, they turned right and went up to Murmansk off the uh, and, and hove to just off Mamansk, which is on the northern areas of Russia. Now, when they landed there, or when they uh, uh, hove to there, the captain of the ship was told by Admiralty not to go any further because there was too many submarines around. 
So he pointed the ship in the direction of Russia and, a, and an airfield called Venga, which was um, in the area of Murmansk. And these pilots had to take off. They'd never taken off from a, a deck before. And they found Russia. They had no maps. They navigated their way, found the airfield. For the next three months, they worked tirelessly against the Germans. They helped to defend Stalingrad and stop the move towards Murmansk. And if Murmansk had fallen, Russia would have been a whole different story. In three months' time, they, the air crew and ground crew were all sent back to the UK. <coughs> the Hurricanes were left in Russia for the Russians to take over. By this time, they'd been taught how to fly them, how to service them, etc. But a year later, Stalin donated the Red Star of Russia, which is on my crest. And from that point on, 81 Squadron was re-equipped with uh, PR, uh, sorry, with Spitfire 5Bs, with desert filters, and they were sent over to the North African campaign. There, they were extremely successful in knocking out a German squadron completely. And by doing that, they then took their Ace of Spades insignia. Once the Germans had been defeated there, the British First Army donated that dagger because 81 Squadron had been part of the Air Force that had gained aerial supremacy. The Germans couldn't compete. Without aerial supremacy, they were lost. So the 81 Squadron was then tasked to go up through Sicily. They got halfway up through Sicily. They were turned around and then sent to India. From there, they worked their way down through there from Burma and arrived in Java where they were re-equipped with the American Thunderbolt which was a big brute of a thing, but still they were converted then from a fighter squadron into a tactical fighter squadron. In 1946, they then ended up in Singapore and 684 Squadron, which had been the uh, uh, photographic reconnaissance squadron, was disbanded and 81 Squadron became 81 PR Squadron. Now that meant that they the funding for them as a fighter squadron no longer came from fighter command, it now came from bomber command because they came under bomber command. Now for the next 24 years, 81 squadron was stable here, operating mainly from Salida until 1958 when they were then posted over to Tenga to take on the uh, Canberras, but they weren't actually equipped with them until 1960. So 81 Squadron took on the mapping until 1948. And in 1948, a certain gentleman called Jim Peng was instructed by the Communist Party in Russia to go on the offensive. Now this is all recorded now, this is all open to you, you can go and check this out on the web. Some of us knew about it beforehand, but we couldn't talk about it. So they went on the offensive and went into the jungle. That's when they started wreaking their havoc. Torturing the local people, de demanding that they fed them and that they carried the munitions for them and used them as whatever they wanted to use them for. And if you don't do it, I'll take hold of you and I'll chop your hands off. And you, I'll take your family and we'll just behead them. I'm not joking, that was what was going on. That was the way they persecuted people to get them to, to do what they wanted to do. So as time went on, the British decided Hearts and minds, we won't go in there doing too much. First of all, one of the things they did was they decided that they would initiate this business about the compounds for food. So that people had to go into the compound, the food was cooked inside there, they ate, and that way the British security forces could then monitor who was going in and who was going out. No food went outside of that, con that compound unless it was inside a pig or a chicken that was left over. So all that leftover food, if there was any, was fed to the pigs and the chickens. So now they were beginning to be starved out. So if you look at all of the states in Malaya 
and including Singapore as well, because there were terrorists in Singapore. If you look at the, um, the, all the states, what the British wanted to do was to turn them into what they called a white state. And that meant it was just a, a recognised. It was like it was the pink parts of the world was British. So once we've got it white state, there's less than 100 CTs active in that area. Um, so we can now re remove a lot of our troops from there and we can move them into other areas. Now, I might be telling you what you already know, but some of you may be surprised at actually what went on behind the scenes. So now we've got the stage where in 1948, the, the emergency was announced. And it was an emergency and not a war because the planters went to the authorities and also to Lloyds of London, who were the insurance company, and said, if you declare it as a war, there's a lot of claims that we won't be able to make. So it was kept down, and that kept the cost of the insurance down as well, and it just lowered it down to the next level, so it became an emergency. Now, when I arrived in Singapore, the first thing that happened to me was I was on active service. That became serious, because if you did anything wrong and you were charged, automatically in front of that charge would be whilst on active service, and that made it a lot more serious court-martial material very often. So if we've got to the stage where I've now arrived and I'm on active service, 81 Squadron was operational. Totally different kettle of fish altogether. We walked around as though we were bulletproof. We were 81 Squadron. Yes, we were a bit cocky, but that's the way we were. We didn't need shiny boots and all the rest of it, etc. We walked around in just our shorts and our tunic, undone. We'd walk over to the, to the mess, etc., and we didn't care about any other people. We got all off an awful lot of duties, but at the same time, when the chips were down and things really started getting serious, and there were some raids on 9X sites, which I'll talk about later, um, that's when we had to start doing multiple guards, etc., etc. Being an operational squadron, it meant that life was a whole lot different to just working from eight to five in a hangar. We, we were on call on an hour's notice, but particularly duty crew. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about what life was like on 81 Squadron. And I'm going to start at five o'clock in the morning, which actually started around about 4.30, because you had to get up and we used to nip over to the, the mess, grab a mug of tea, couple of rounds of toast and waddle across whilst the key orderly had cycled down to the main gate at Salida, collected the keys to open up the hangar. Now if we had a member of the duty crew, which was one member of each trade, so we had engines, airframes, wireless, um, photography, electrician, each one of those plus a, um, a corporal to oversee everything. He had to oversign in the Form 700, which I'll explain about in a moment. So, we've got a, a duty crew going in. If we had somebody that was uh, on um, in married quarters, he would normally nip round on his bike, pick up the keys and come into the squadron and open up. Now our purpose was, it was only a small team, to get the aircraft out in the right order, ready for takeoff. So we were there two hours beforehand, and at seven o'clock the main crew would come in. By that time we were ready to get aircraft off in the air. Now we had maximum support, maximum manpower, because we had duty crew and normal crew in. Now we might be short staffed because we might have dis detachments all over the place. We might have two or three detachments all at once, so that depleted our manpower. So when the chips were down, everybody mucked in. Camaraderie was at an extremely high level. And Eddie, our friend Eddie here, was on 81 Squadron. He actually joined the Royal Air Force. He's Singaporean, joined the Royal Air Force before the Singapore Air Force was in vogue. And the camaraderie on that squadron, and everybody that I've spoken to that was on 81 Squadron said it was the best squadron in the Air Force. And I agree with that. So by seven o'clock in the morning, we're getting ready now, the pilots are coming in, they're getting in the aircraft, or if it's a, if it's, um, a navigator as well, if they're twin seaters and so forth, it's like the mosquitoes, then it would be a pilot and navigator. 
Now we'd be looking after those aircraft. They'd all been um, BFI'd. Now BFI, uh, there was going to be some terminology up on the screen later on, but the BFI was a before flight inspection. So off they went. Then tidy up, 8 o'clock, duty crew would knock off. Off to the mess and have breakfast. Back to the billet, shower, and if you had to do anything like go to the education section or something like that, well, you had time. By about 11.30, you'd be over at the mess having your, your lunch. 12 o'clock, you'd be back over to the squadron. Now you had this one hour overlap again because the normal crew knocked off at 1 o'clock. Now, in between this, you had a whole host of other duties that you did. Now, the duty crew would stay on until the aircraft had returned in the afternoon. And if there was any snags on the aircraft, that's problems with the aircraft when they came back, beyond being refuelled and being AFI, that's after flight inspection, then they would normally stay on if, they, if it was a simple task that we could perform with a, with a reduced number of people, we would make sure that aircraft was ready for the next morning because we were operational. We had to have those aircraft ready. We never knew what the requirement was until the next morning. So we've now got to probably three, four o'clock in the afternoon, and in between that, we've also had air traffic control phone us up and say, we've got a visiting aircraft coming in. Can you go and look after it for us, please? So in would come all these aircraft. Now, the thing that we used to amuse us, we used to confuse the Americans by saying, <laughs> I, was, I was at um, Clark Airfield Base in the Philippines on the way up to Kai Tak on a detachment, and we could only stay there one night, <clears throat> and we met up with these Americans, and. This American said to me, so what do you do, fella? I said, he said, what do you, you know, what, what do you need you in? And I explained it all to him and I said, well, he said, what do you do? And I said, I work on engines. He said, oh, what on? I said, I can't tell you. I said, why not? No, I can't tell you. Oh, this puzzled them. They hated this. Oh, okay, so you can't tell us. Oh, it's secret, isn't it? Well, you, know, you said it. So anyhow, <clears throat> this fella came up to me and said, what, what do you do? I said, I work on engines. He said, oh, so do I. He said, what part do you work on? I said, I beg your pardon? He said, what part do you work on? I said, what part of what? He said, the engines. I said, I work on engines. He said, yeah, I know. He said, I know. He said, but shh, what part do you work on? I said, I work on engines, the whole of the engine. He said, no, nah, yeah, he said, I realise that. He said, but what part? Do you work on the carburetors or the plugs? Or the... I said, no, I work on the whole damn thing. And he still couldn't get it. Finally, I think it and he understood what I was talking about. And I said, well, I'm going to confuse you even more now. He said, oh, yeah, why? Yeah. So I said, I was trained on turbines. You know what they are? And he said, yeah. I said, jet engines. So he said, yeah. I said, the first aircraft I ever worked on after my training was a piston aircraft. <laughs> and he said, no way. And I said, you better believe it. He said, well, what was it? I said, I can't tell you. <laughs> he said, oh, it was secret, was it? I said, oh, yeah, it was secret. It was a Spitfire. <laughs> but even then, the Spitfire was a magnificent aircraft because there was nothing could fly with our PR-19s because of the, um, the Griffin engines on them. There was nothing could get as high as them, and they couldn't go as fast as them, even the, the latest jets. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. So anyhow... We've confused the hell out of these Americans because they, they only worked on either the spark plugs or the... And I do believe, if I remember rightly, one place spoke said, yeah, he said, I, I work on the oil plug. So he took the oil plug out and put it back in, but somebody else put the oil in. <laughs> so I couldn't believe it. So anyhow, I said, well, we do all of that. The whole damn thing. Okay, so we've done the duty crew. We got through to 8 o'clock. We got through to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, then the next thing that would hit us would be probably there'd be night flying that night as well. Now, depending on what the manning levels were, how many detachments we had, how many people were off the squadron, maybe for occasional sickness, although we didn't have many, much of that, but they might have been on holiday or something like that, leave. So very often they'd get called back. And on top of that, when there was a few um, periods when there was some activity with the CTs, the communist terrorists, uh, we would have to go on guard duty as well. And it's not the first time that I've gone on guard duty, which was 12 hours normally on searchlight posts. And you would go over to the uh, to East Camp, 
you would um, parade on the parade ground over there and the smartest man on parade would be picked for the orderly officer's runner. And it meant you went and sat down all night long, boring as watching paint dry in the officer's mess. And it wasn't until probably two, three o'clock in the morning that things started living up when you had to go and wake up the officers. So that wasn't very interesting. I never actually had to do that. But anyhow, when you went on guard duty, there were three stags. There were six to eight, eight to ten, to ten to twelve. And then you started again. The one who'd done six to eight did twelve to two. Then the one who'd done the middle rank did the, the two to four. And then, so if I was on duty crew as well and couldn't get off it because the emergency was causing some ructions then, then I, very, I would have a letter from my CO stating that I had to go on the first stag. That was six to eight, 12 to two. So at least I could get about an hour's sleep. And then by the time I'd got, you got back from being picked up on the Gary, got back into the guard room, I could have about an hour's sleep before the, the Gary went out again then. I would go on that, or whoever was on the, would go on that, go round and he would drop me off at the squadron. And then I'd be back on the squadron at five o'clock in the morning. And sometimes you do that three times in a week. After a while, you begin to think, oh, oh, I'm exhausted. But the adrenaline kept flowing, and that's what I loved. I loved the first line servicing. I didn't want to work in a hangar. It was the most exhilarating period I think I can ever remember. And on top of that, we used to get down to Singapore as well, which at the time was, it could sometimes be a little bit scary because of what was going on, because there was people out there looking for us. And if they could have a go at you in the dark, they would. But these were their CTs. And you couldn't tell who they were, because they used to drift onto the, you know, in, into the darkness, into the background sort of thing. Then we had night flying as well, because once a month, the air crews had to keep their night flying hours up. So we'd do some night flying, and that would go on till probably 11 o'clock at night. Now, some people might say, how the hell do you actually steer an aircraft, or marshal it, as we used to call? How do you, how do you marshal an aircraft in the dark? Because we used to have little things like tennis, uh, table tennis bats. These were our battens, you see, and we just used to use those, and we'd use them for... If I move this microphone away now, I'm gonna, you're going to miss the, what I'm going to say. But anyhow, oh, you, if you wanted an aircraft that's coming towards you, and you wanted him to turn to his port, which is his left, looking forward, right? and you wanted to go around there and then come around, then what you would do is you'd just keep on doing this and then, watch me. Then if you were gonna hand him over to somebody else who was wanting to direct him somewhere else, you would then just do this. And then the pilot knew you were being handed over to somebody else. But while that aircraft was on the ground and you were marshalling it, that aircraft was in my control, not the pilot. The pilot was there as the driver. I was the one that told him where to go. Because if that aircraft came a cropper, guess who was to blame? So if that aircraft was damaged or there was any damage caused, etc., by that aircraft, by the wingtip or something like that, here's where the buck stopped in modern terminology. So we had these little torches and on the end was a little cylindrical piece of white plastic so that it shone upwards, etc., and then this is what they could see, and they could see us using these battens in the dark, etc. Now, I did hear the other day from a, <laughs> an Australian Air Force bloke who said, when I was telling him, we were, we were comparing stories about the silly things that used to happen on squadron, etc., like sending a new bloke, we had a new engine bloke come on squadron, we'd say to him, uh, well, could you nip over to the stores, please, and get a box of blue spark gaps, please? Spark, uh, blue sparks. What for? Well, these plugs are no good, so we want the sparks, right? Well, there was no such thing. <laughs> we were just having them on. Or send him over for a left-handed screwdriver. <laughs> Mine was ambidextrous in both hands. <laughs> so if it didn't... But this was just the way we had these people on. We'd send them over there and ask them for a, um, a black and white paint. Incidentally, if you've ever seen the propellers on, a, on an aircraft and you see the yellow tips on the end of it, I remember saying, 
excuse me, <laughs> and I was saying to this American this night, you know why the yellow paint's on the end, don't you? He said, ah, oh, yeah, guess, so, so you can see the sir. I said, nah, it's to stop the black paint slipping off. <laughs> so we used to have good fun with them. They were good, they were good blokes, but they, they um, oh, sometimes you could lead them up the garden path so easily. So anyhow, um, so we used to have these fun and games with the lo with new crew that was coming on. You know, the new moon men that came out, as we were called. I was a moon man at one time as well, or an aspro man, they called us. You see? So um, we would have to learn the hard way. And when I first went on the squad and I looked at all these blokes and they were just, they were monsters, they were giants. These blokes that just swaggered around and I thought, wow. I was almost intimidated by the whole thing. And then later on in my three years that I spent on 81 squad, because two and a half years was the normal regular period and I signed on for an extra six. I hated it that much. So at the end of it, I couldn't understand why on one occasion, I was about 18 months into my time, and I saw this order come up on squadron orders that there was an exchange posting with a fellow up in Sekong, which is just north of Kai Tak, for those that might not know. Um, and same trade, everything else, etc., same rank. And I, said, and I thought, oh, yeah, that'd be interesting. So I put an application in that morning, about an hour later. Our admin corporal came running out and said, Al, get upstairs quick. Where? CO wants to see you. Oh, hang on, I'll go and get my jacket. No, just get up there. Someone up there, and he said, I understand. He said, you've um, applied for an exchange I said, yes. He said, why? I said, oh, just further my career sort of thing, you know. And I said, I thought, don't know why, but yeah, I'll, t I'll try it out. So he showed me this massive great map on the back of his, on the wall of his office. And he showed me where Singapore was, and he showed me where Hong Kong was, and then he showed me where Kai Tak was, and then he showed me the Red Communist border, and it was just that far away sort of thing. And he said, now, do you still want to go? Anybody here been 19? 18, 19 and a half? Yeah. Anybody thought, I can't say no now, can I? I said, yes, so I've got to go through with it. So I said, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. So you went, tore it up and said, denied. Put it in the bin. Any questions? No, sir. Good. Go on then, get back into your job. Thanks very much, sir. Off I went. I didn't find out until about six months later, no, it'd be less than that, but four months later, I was put on a detachment, Kai Tak. Meanwhile, I found out in 2006, I had the pleasure of meeting my old CO. I was gonna say the pleasure of going back to the UK, but I, no, we went back to the UK because it was the first reunion of the 81 Squadron Association. Plus, I could see our daughter who was over there at the time, so we could go over there and my wife and I could see our daughter. And uh, I saw a lot of aircraft collections, which is my passion. I said to him at the time, you know when you tore up my application, why did you do that? He said, it was quite simple. He said, I had to look forward, he said. It's like playing a game of chess, he said. You were my senior engine mech. I'd never looked at it like that before. I was just an SAC, three ranks up from the bottom. But he said to me, no, I couldn't afford to let you go. You knew too much. Okay, thanks very much, sir. The other thing I learned from him was, when I said to him, you know, it's strange that sometimes we'd wake up in the morning and somebody had gone. Yeah. It's almost as though Big, big Brother was watching us. Yeah. So do you mean that we were being observed? Or he said, oh, yeah. You don't realise just what was going on. And it's only just recently I found out the actual fact that our squadron and our JAPIC, which was the Joint Aerial Photographic Reconnaissance Intelligence Unit, and JARIC and a few others we all came under the direction of MI6. And we were under close scrutiny all the time. So a lot of the missions that we were, we were doing were not only against the CTs, but they were in other areas that we weren't supposed to be. Commonly known nowadays as deniables. And if you want to find out more about that, that'll be on the screen in a moment. So 
How are we doing with what's on the screen? We're still doing it. Okay, look, while we're here, let's talk about Salida for a while. Um, where are we now? Just let me have a look. Where's the... Uh, oh, here. Right, this is 205, 209. Is that right, lying? Am I in the right spot? Good. This little area here, this was where 205 and the Sunderlands used to, used to be moored along here. This is Salida. This is West Camp, and you've got East Camp over here. So this is where the Sunderlands used to be out here, and they used to be serviced out here as well, on the water, because they had cradles that they suspended from the aircraft, etc. and the mechanics would be in there working on the aircraft. If there was a serious big ov overhaul, then they would draw them in and pull them up the ramp and into the hangar here. This area here, a well-known area called 9X site, that's uh, as, as accurate as we can at this stage point out that that area there that was another compound within the fenced area of RF Salida. The only area that wasn't fenced was along this seawall area here. But that was internally manned as well, 24 hours of the day. There were guards inside there because that was the Far East Air Force ammunition and bomb dump. Round the perimeter were searchlight posts, the same as there were round the perimeter, the outside of Salida. And we would normally do a 12 hour flight, two on, four off. When I came over to Singapore, I was about 18 and three quarters. I wasn't old enough to go in a pub, and I wasn't old enough to vote. But I was old enough to have a rifle put in my hands and five rounds and told to go out and shoot people. Not to, that's usually. Our codes of terms of engagement were pretty strict. You are not allowed to fire that firearm unless somebody is actually firing at you. Oh, thanks very much for that. Yeah, I really feel confident about that. And on the top of a searchlight post, the idea was that you were told intermittently to turn the searchlight on. The only problem with that was that the searchlight took about five minutes to get up to full <laughs> brightness. So as soon as the, you flick the switch, two things happened. This dull light started to go... <laughs> and took about five minutes to get bright. Plenty of time for the enemy, the CTs, to just go and hide. And the second thing that happened was every damn insect Every beetle, every mosquito, every snake, and everything else that could fly, bang! It was a magnet for it. And one of the very first searchlight duty I did, I had my sleeves rolled up, and I put my hand up on my head to scratch my head or do something like that, and all of a sudden, this thing hit me on the arm. And it was wheezing and coughing and spluttering, in, and I was so petrified. My heart went four kilometres that way and back again before I actually settled down. I couldn't fathom out what the hell this was. Never had anything like this happen to me before. I came from a rural part of the UK where you wouldn't say boot or goose. It was the biggest monster of a beetle that you've ever seen. It nearly broke my finger when I flicked it. And it went, ah, like it, it was still on my arm. So we had to learn all these things. It didn't put me off. But anyhow, this was the searchlight post. We had a few incidents when um, there was a few people who took a pot shot. Luckily enough, they didn't take a pot shot at me. But anyhow, there was all these little incidents that was happening and so forth, right? So we've got the stage now where we've done the guard duties, etc. Detachments, yeah. Detachments used to come along and they would be to places like um, Kai Tak, Salon. Oh, Salon, interesting little story here. Oh, sorry, we'll go back to here. Right, now, I'm a bit too close here. Okay, there's H Block. That was my home for three years. Ground floor H Block. One of the sad things that I saw a few years ago now was that machine demolishing it. They can't do that. That's H-Block. That's my home. But they bloody well did it. It was the largest accommodation block in the Royal Air Force. 
G block, which was this one, was slightly smaller. In between the two was the parade ground. Over here was the mess. At this end was the technical cinema. At that end was the corporal's mess. And in the middle was the airman's mess. This is where I used to feed. Up top was a sort of a leisure room. Then there was the naffy. Then there was the corporal's naffy. So this road out here took us up to the hangar of 81 Squadron, there. These were the two silver hangars, and that was the hangar that 81 Squadron used to occupy half of that hangar. They now, we are now occupied that western part of the hangar. Air traffic control was down here somewhere, if I remember rightly. I can't fathom out what those aircraft are, but they're not mosquitoes. Um, but anyhow, this, this, this road went down here in front of, this was the Malay Regiment area, and down here was the ground defence training area, and then this road carried on down to the, to the sea wall. So over the back here, we had a little bathhouse where a little Indian fellow used to stoke up that with wood every day, and if you wanted a bath, you went over there and you had a hot bath. You could also get a haircut over there and also get shoes and boots made to measure. So I used to have my boots, my football boots made once a year because they lasted one season. And if you wanted your shoes made, I used to have them made there. And that was where I bought my first pair. Ladies, put your fingers in your ears, please. That's where I had my first set of brothel creepers. That was what we nicknamed them because they had crepe soles. <laughs> Purely by name, that's all, right? But anyhow, there we go. So here's the searchlight post. And they were dotted around the perimeter. Uh, this was the aircraft dump. So all of the aircraft that came in, and a gentleman was talking to me tonight about his father flew the Hornets. Well, we copped all the Hornets. We thought they'd all come from Tanger, but I've just learned tonight that a lot of them came from Butterworth, and they flew down here, and they were lined up everywhere. And gradually they were towed around here and broken up. A couple of stories about the, air, airport, the air, aircraft dump. Chiefy used to use me as a bit of a, a gopher. And he said to me one night, he said, one day, he said, uh, Taylor, come here. Yep, sorry. Go over to the dump, he said, and get me a, 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 a port oleo leg from... Righto, Chief. So I went over there. I got about that far, and I turned around and walked back. I walked into the office and said, Chief, there's no oleo legs over there for a meat box. I'll meet you. I said, yes, there is. I said, no, there's not, Chief. I said, we haven't, we haven't lost a meat box since I've been here, anyhow. He said, there is one over there. I said, sorry, Chief, there's not. He said, oh, my goodness. He got up. And he was a big, big fella. And he used to walk like, a, like this sort of thing. You know? He said, come on. And we walked over there. And we're walking around. I said, look, Chief, there's nothing here. And he said, yes, there is. Look, just over there. I said, where? He said, just over there. I said, I'm watching. I said, do you mean over here? He said, yeah. I said, there's no male. And he's going. And I'm going. Uh, and in the end, he won. Okay, chief. So I went over there. And all I could pick up was a bundle of quarter inch tube, which had been bent backwards and forwards into a bundle. Just copper tube. I walked out, I said, do you mean this earlier leg, Chief? He said, yep. Oh, that earlier leg you meant? So he said, yeah. Went back to the hangar and he said, right, now, get uh, Paddy Spratt out. He was our Air Force driver. Get the bomb trolley on. He said, get over there and pick up an earlier leg for an exchange, right? Okay, he said, there's all the requisition order. So we got in the... Land Rover with him. Off we went over to West Camp, which would have been, sorry, can you put that one, please, Sly? Yeah, which would have been, oh, sorry, it's over here, right? It was on, on East Camp, right? But, oh, yeah, okay, here we go. Now, where are we now? There's the runway. It was over, uh, there's the officer's mess. No, wait, stop playing around with it. I can't find it. <laughs> Anyhow, it was over on East Camp. So, we barreled off over there. Rolled up outside, Paddy Spratt said to me, now listen, he was an Irishman, he said, now listen, I said, just go in there, he said, and give him a, don't talk to him, do you understand? So he said, just give it to him, give him the paperwork, get out, come on in. Right, 
So I walked down the side of the hangar, gave the, the bloke was quite happy, he got something to tick off, walked down, and as I looked down, the six blokes picking up this wooden box. Now the oleo leg stood about this high, and it was about that size, and it was solid metal. And this was the landing leg for the wheel that was on the bottom of it. It took six blokes to carry it. I must have been extremely strong because I carried it in one hand. So when I got back, I said to Chief, um, you're not going to be happy, Chief. He said, well, I said, look at the other leg we picked up. He said, oh, never mind. He said, well, well that, that one will do. Now, the theory was that the bloke in supply up the front didn't care what you gave him as long as he had something. He was a supply clerk. He was not an aircraft engineer or, or mechanic. He didn't know an oleo leg from a, a left sock. So we got away with it. And I said to Chief, Chief, what's going to happen if somebody finds out? He said, well, by that time, he said, we'll have the other oleo leg, won't we? <laughs> so I said, oh, yes. What had happened was an aircraft had gone US up in, it was either KL or Butterworth, I can't remember now, and the oleo leg had collapsed. So it had to come back, see? So Chief, he had a friend who was in transport command at Changi, and he also had a friend who was in MT section. So MT section sent a truck up, on went the Ole leg, off over to Changi, delivered to the Air, uh, um, um, Air Force Transport Squadron, on the aircraft, up there, other one came back down, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, all the way back to us, and well, we've got an, an Ole leg now. What do we do with it, Chief? He said, just leave it. But Chief, surely shouldn't we be taking it? No, 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 no. You've got to learn the ropes, mate. I said, yeah, okay. Learning the ropes, Chief. Yeah, I'm certainly learning the ropes, Chief, and I'm waiting for him to tell me about it. He said, if they come back and say, we've got an inventory here that's short of an oleo leg. Oh, well, we've got one here you can have. So we'd give them our one, you see, and they, they wouldn't know any different. We'd help them out then. Now we've done them a favour. There was another occasion when Chief he sent me over there, and oh, it was just impo impossible, but anyhow. Uh, that, was, that was what it was like on the squadron. Okay, um, yeah, the detachments. Uh, one interesting one at Salon. Two aircraft were sent up to Salon. No instructions, no knowledge. This very often happened. You didn't know till you got up there what you were up there for. These two, air, these two mosquitoes arrived up in Salon. And the thing that, went, that happened was that... Oh, look at this. Way. See this bloke? So Anybody know who he is? Yeah? Anybody know? Who is it? Gregory Peck. Okay. This was a film, The Purple Plane. See those guns on the front? Aircraft landed. These technicians from the filming company rocked up and said, so who are you? We're 81 Squadron. So what are these? The mosquitoes. Where's the guns? We don't have guns, we're a photographic reconnaissance unit. You're no good, go on, off you go. What do you mean? We want guns. We're filming, a f we're making a film here with guns on the, with fighters. You know, those things that go bang and all that sort of, yeah, we know all about that, but we don't have them. Well, we need them. So one of our members, Wilbur Wright, who in in incidentally was in uh, initiated the 81 Squadron Association, he pushed it hard and actually formed it in 2006. Him and his oppo, overnight, played around with the, because this was a clear perspex nose, and it had all the markings on it for the pilot and navigator to see so that when they were doing their photographic run, they could line up, and they knew exactly if they were taking uh, head-on shots or if they were, so they could plan where their photographs were going to be taken. So overnight, they had to make these guns. Dead simple for the Air Force. They can make guns dead, dead easy. So what do we use? Broomsticks. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have to go bang. <laughs> so these were the Mark Ones, right? <laughs> so these were actually broomsticks. And you can't tell the difference. <laughs> so Wilbur Wright and another one of the ground crew actually ended up as... Um, as uh, taking a small part in the purple plane. But that was top secret. Nobody had to know about it, etc.
But that was a story about, a, now he played the part of a, of a, um, uh, a Canadian pilot who was attached to a, the Royal Air Force, etc. And he's, this aircraft had been lost and they got to, got to go in there and find it and so forth. So they had to have these mosquitoes. So we sent two mosquitoes up. Okay, this is a Thunderbolt. This is the American Thunderbolt that um, the 81 Squadron were... See the, see the Ace of Spades? That was uh, Jugus Fada 53, which was one of the four squadrons in a group. An 81 Squadron knocked that squadron out in the, uh, North Africa. So they took their Ace of Spades as their logo. Now these were big and brutish, big and brutish. This was when 81 Squadron became a tactical fighter squadron for a short period of time until they ended up in Java and then from Java they gave these away and then flew over to um, Singapore and took on the, yep, Spitfire. Now this is the PR-19. That is not actually PS-888, that's the PS-916, but this is PS-888. Sorry, my dear. Sorry? PS, it was just a, um, a code, so you, you, that would be known as Peter Sugar in phonetic language. In a phonetic language. You'll find out more about that in a minute. So, treble eight, it's got a meaning for the Chinese, isn't it? Isn't that good luck or something? Okay. This beauty, this is the actual aircraft. That was the last Spitfire flown of the Royal Air Force in the world on operational duties. Now the other picture, if we could put that one on live, the, no, the, uh, that's it. When the aircraft, that aircraft returned on its last flight, it was flown by the, the then squadron commander, squadron leader, Swaby. And as he landed, two things happened. One was George Travers was part of the ground crew and Brian Lofty Rose was actually working in another section, nothing to do with 81 Squadron, but he was a, what was called a painter and doper. That was his trade. And this was recognised as being the last, not this one, but the one that Squadron Leader Swaby was, was flying. And George Travers was given a brush and some white paint by Brian Lofty Rose, who became an honorary member of 81 Squadron because of his work for the squadron and the association. And George Travers painted the last on it. Interesting story about the Roundel. First World War, the British gunners and the Allied gunners were firing at the British aircraft. That's handy, isn't it? Nice to know that your friends are, that's called blue on blue. But nice to know that you're loved that much. So the reason was that they had the Union Jack on all their aircraft and they couldn't see it from the ground and it was confusing. But the French aircraft never got fired on. So it was decided that there would be an agreement between the, the Allied forces, which was mainly the French and the British, that the British would also adopt this roundel. The only trouble was that they changed the colouring so that they knew, but it looked the same from the ground. So that's the origins of the roundel on, and over the years, this would change colours depending, and sometimes the theatres that they fought in, just so they could be identified. Like on the aircraft that were involved in the, um, the Normandy landing, they would have the white streaks on their wings. So that denoted them as being involved in that force, so they could be identified by the uh, by their own gunners on the ground, the artillery and so forth. Okay, now this is RG314, Roger George, in phonetic language, 314. And the interesting part about this is, there's two beautiful Rolls-Royce Merlins. One of them rotated one way, and the other one rotated the other way. This was deliberate because if you were flying a Spitfire, because of the torque on the propeller, when it took off, it had a tendency to want to go one way. So you had to counteract that strongly. Other than that, 
The Spitfire was relatively free from any foibles. It was related by all of who flew it as being a beautiful lady of the sky. So, whoops, yeah, we're back here. Now, underneath here would be a series of cameras, up to seven, I believe, and some of them would stand about this high. Now we're getting into the part about photographic reconnaissance, first of all. Photographic reconnaissance was photographing just the ground and mapping. In 1948, 81 Squadron took on another project, which was Fire Dogs. And Fire Dogs was the name given to the operations or the sorties for photographic intelligence that was against the CTs. Now, flying at anything from 15 to 25,000 feet, if somebody had walked across wet grass in the morning, it could be identified. The photographic intelligence people, once they got our pictures, would then, I would then bisect these photographs and start to look at them very, very closely. And they could tell an awful lot from these photographs. Purely and simply because they knew what they were looking for. And if they didn't know what they were looking for and they came across something strange, well, that's when they started going into overdrive because these people were the very best of the intelligence people. They thought outside the circle completely. Now, the sort of thing that they noticed was that anybody that saw that three by two mosaic that Lai Ying made up last year showing the Bukit Brown area, we were able to show on that where there's nothing but a canopy of trees. What can you see through that? You can't see a thing. But the intelligence people could look at that and say, there's a little white fleck there. What is that there for? Why is that there? It wasn't there yesterday, it was here today. Eventually, they found out it could be smoke. If it's smoke, there's a fire down below. So if there's no kampong in the area, it could be the CTs down there. So we'll send a patrol in there. The other thing about it was that they could also identify if there was, um, if the area was, had a lot of civilians around there. Because if it was, then they wouldn't go in and bomb it or rocket, fire rockets at it or whatever the case may be. Because they didn't want any collateral damage to the locals. So it was very much hearts and minds. Now, the intelligence that they could find out from that is of great interest in the sense that what I want to show you now is, can you see the end of that? Doesn't mean much to you at that distance, does it? That's the view that you would get if you was looking at that from up there. So say you were suspended from the ceiling and I did that. What these intelligence people were looking for was at the right time of the day, they knew exactly when that photograph had been taken. They knew exactly what the navigational coincidences were. What they were looking at then is at that time of the day, where would the sun be? Where was the shadow? How long was the shadow? It's a simple then mathematical and geometry test there. You can detect what the height of that is. So if that was a lamppost, you could determine what the height of that lamppost was. You're now beginning to understand what can be developed from those photographs for intelligence purposes. The first notification of jet aircraft being flown by the Germans during the Second World War was when the photographic intelligence people picked up. There was two strange marks on the grass. And there's another two here. There's another two over there. What are they? Eventually it was found out that it was probably burn marks. And they then found out that because the early German jet engines always developed a large flame out the back, etc., it burnt the grass. They could find out then one of the, one of the ruses caused, uh, uh, carried out by particularly Americans, was they would have all these blow-up models of, blow-up meaning <laughs> not boom, you know, uh, but they would have all these tanks or aircraft or trucks. They would be blow-up models. And they would just batten them down and it would give the Germans the impression that, oh, there's a big build-up here of an army. Look, we've got, we better reinforce this, etc. And it was all part of the deceit. But if the Germans tried it, the intelligence people would look at it and say, hey, hang on a minute. 
If that's a tank, how did it get there? The one thing that the tank leaves is it leaves evidence, big evidence, in its footprint. And all you get is the grass trampled around where this thing had been blown up and then pegged down. And sometimes you could go there and find that that tank's gun one day was pointing this way and the next day it was bent like this and pointing over here because the wind had blown it over maybe. That's the level of intelligence that was picked out of these photographs. So when you and your parents or your relatives were quietly going about your business, you were being photographed probably. So when you start looking at all of these photographs that we can show you, there's other little things that will creep in. Now, this is the Faithful Annie, VL334. Twin engines, originally designed as a bomber, but ended up more as a communication aircraft. Now, this aircraft was used in stealth, in the sense that there was one occasion when it was called out on a Saturday morning, and I was on that duty crew. We got called out, get the Faithful Annie again. So we wheeled her out, started her up, did the... Um, BFI, checked out, in came the pilot and the, and the photographers and so forth and hopped in and this was actually photographers that went with them as well because they did a lot of handheld shots and it flew at a very low level and there was a Russian ship broken anchor during the night and was sailing up the Straits of Malacca, just flew along gently, out of observation, took a few photographs etc and there are a few of those photographs around. Now you'll notice on the front these are, what known, these are what's known as flats. And that was a, a glass panel. And behind that could be an oblique camera, either facing sideways, downwards, upwards, outwards. And if we go back to that, can we go back to that picture of um, the last? Yeah, okay. Now, can we go back to the other one? Yeah, this is. Now, see that little circle there? That's a flat. If you're looking at a PR19, the way you can tell it's a PR19 is that's what you look for. Now, you didn't know about that, you do now. So this is what we look for in photographs. This is what the intelligence people are looking for. Behind that was an oblique camera. So that if a pilot wanted to fly like this and take pictures over here or over there, because on this side he would only be photographing on his port side. So he could fly over and by vision he could see that and he'd go click, 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 and he'd be taking pictures. He also had the downward facing cameras underneath. And he would control that from the cockpit on the top of it. Instead of the, gu the gun button, there was a camera button. And all these cameras had what was called focal plane shutters. And that was a curtain that was operated by an electric motor with a gap between the curtain. And depending on the gap would depend on the, on the exposure. So when he clicked it, it would go shoop, click it, click, and it would go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and that was what was exposing the emulsion. And as the Blind was rolled over, so the negatives were rolled over. Right, so we've got here, we would have the, uh, whoops, underneath the mozzie, we'd have a bank of maybe five cameras, and then there could also be some forward-facing ones from the front here. Okay? Faithful Annie, we've done right now. Some of you may have seen this last year, many of you might not have done. I'm going to ask Lai Ying, please, to come up if you wouldn't mind, and explain to you, if you can't read all of this, etc., because I'm sure I can't, apart from I can read this bit, um, and he'll just very quickly explain to you the different languages and the meaning behind it and the, the, um, the, the very precise Chinese language that was used in it, etc. Sometimes a bit vague and a bit strange, right? But anyway, there you go. Um, I'm going to focus on this last line. This is a very traditional Chinese curse that you don't have a proper burial ground when you die. So this leaflet has this final question. Do you think that ever think that if you were, were to die in the mountains without a place for a proper burial? Yes. To encourage them to surrender to the police or military forces by uh, suggesting this question to the communist terrorists hiding in the mountains. So all these are just questions. Do you know that the, you have lost the support of the people and so on and so forth? Not critical. This is the most important question raised at the end of this leaflet. Yeah, have you ever think that you will die in the mountains without a proper burial ground? Yeah. <laughs> so these are just the standard, uh, uh, the kind of, uh, all, all the languages. I can only read two languages. 
not the rest of the languages. But apparently, these are just standard warning. But this is particularly very uh, focused with the communist terrorists, mostly of Chinese, Chinese <laughs> ethnic Chinese. So the, the thing is, 你们有没有想到王死三中会有葬身之地吗? Oh, yes, this is the threat to the, the people hiding in the mountains. Thank you. Now, um, where's the bowl of noodles? Anyone got the bowl of noodles? Yeah. No? Here is it? Oh, good. Right, because we've got to move on a bit. Now, this is interesting from the point of view that I walked around um, Salida, 2009, and there's two stories on there that were written by a fellow called Ng Zi Yong. And as we walked around there, I was talking to him, and I was relating various stories to him, and he said to me, stop, 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 stop. And he put his hands to the side of his head, and he said, my head's spinning. He said, all these stories, he said, they're all overlapping. I said, like a bowl of spaghetti? He said, yeah. I said, oh, no, hang on, that bowl of noodles. Because if you look at that bowl of noodles, all of those strands that overlap, this is what he was talking about. So somewhere in there probably might be a story about your relatives. Like last year we talked about KY. And unfortunately last year I didn't finish it off about KY. I somehow got sidetracked. But the reason why KY measured me three times for those people that were at the chat last year was because he said, first time you come in, very upright, very British. No good. Second time, after we talked about one thing, he said, second time, you relax, that's better. Third time, that's as I want you. That's how I want my suit to fit you. So I was now relaxed. He made my suit fit like a glove. He said, when you walk out here, I want you to walk out the normal way you are, not like this, and then all of a sudden do this, because then it hangs like a sack. And you could tell a KY suit because of the way it hung. Okay, so we've got a bowl of rice, a bowl of noodles here. Hopefully all of these stories are like that bowl of noodles. Can we have the other bowl of noodles on, please? Lying? The difference between this one and that one in now is plainly obvious. But let's think about this on another level. I was talking about Uttaram Park earlier on. Anybody that doesn't know anything about it, please find out about it. It was an atrocious, it was an atrocity. It was worse than Changi. You would get a little cup of rice, if you were lucky, there was rice in it. And you were given 30 seconds to eat that. And if you didn't eat it, you didn't get anything the next day. That's how bad it was. Many of those prisoners in Uton Road went blind because they didn't have that or that or that in their rice. If they were lucky once a week when they were on the slop patrol, when they went out and emptied their latrine bucket in the garden and they could find some magnolia leaves or some grass or something like that and they could get enough to feed them for a few days and sneak it in somehow, many of them, their eyesight came back. A lot of those, well all of those prisoners and the ones at Changi would have given their right arm to have a bowl of noodles like that. It drives even a nice silly when we sit in the restaurant and see people leave half a plate of food. Next time you sit down to your bowl of noodles, maybe you'd like to stop and reflect on what went on before and the sacrifice that went into us all being here today. Think about what those people went through. A lot of them died on their own. That's why I would like you to think about the bowl of rice noodles. Next time you sit down for a meal, just stop for a moment. Think about your heritage. Think about your relatives or people that you may not have known. that would have loved just a plain bowl of noodles like that or tasteless noodles like that. That's what we were trying to correct during the emergency. Have we got time for a few questions? Anybody got any questions? Just 
one second, sir, please. Rank. My rank. My rank. Can you go back to the first page, please, Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a, Oh, come on. Now, go, go, look. Now, the gentleman asked what my rank was. The three props means I was a senior aircraftsman. Bottom of the rank is just an, an AC2 recruit. AC2, then you become qualified as an AC1. Then you get an accreditation when you go on to a unit as an LAC if, you, if you're competent. And then the next stage up is... And above that is a corporal. So that was my rank. And the one thing you never forget in the forces is your, is your number. 4159331 ACC Taylor Ace. Sir. And my 1250 card, my, my identity card was 12, uh, 569, 56094A. That was my identity card number, my 1250. Yep, sorry. So my question is actually... Um so when you all were doing the photography, the people who were doing the photography, right? So how do they get the image to be really nice and sharp? Because I saw the photos, they are very well taken. Given the condition that they, they were flying and the flight was like, you know, tremors and this, which are not really good for photography. How did they make all the images so good, so sharp? Do you know? The, the images. Quality of the equipment. No, 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 no. The images. Sorry? The image. Image? Yeah. The image. All the squadrons, all the pictures. That How were they made? All the areas, photo, yeah. yes. Okay. Well, that was, um, once they were printed, that went into Japik and Jarek, which was other sections. So when they were printed, they were developed and printed, they would then go into these other sections. And then they would start making up the mosaics and they would start interpreting then. So these went out to all the different intelligence units, Army, Air Force, Navy. Right, and they would then pick out what information they wanted. And then they had these people that were specialised in deciphering what was hidden in those photos. So they actually took a lot of the same shot just to pick out the best of the lot? Um, they, yeah, they were either good or bad. If, if they were bad photographs, then it meant that there was maybe oil had been splashed on the underside or there was condensation. But all of the aircraft, there would be an air duct run down, a hot air duct, to, because they were flying at... Um, 25 to 30,000 feet, which could be the temperatures of around about minus 18 or 20, which is the temperature you keep ice cream at. Thank you. Yes, sir. That was a very interesting uh, walk through the past in history. How do you feel now where um, they've got satellites flying overhead? They don't have photographic squadrons anymore. And when you walk on the grass, they can also tell that, you know, the dew has been stepped on in the morning. I'm proud that we're now they, unique. <laughs> they, they can even tell how tall the men in that compound in yeah. Atomabad, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden, they could tell how high was the man, how tall was the man who walked in that compound. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this so, was... Yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry. So, so how do you feel now that the technology has changed and in a way uh, what you're doing is okay, well, purely uh, you know yeah. now part of history yeah well that's progress for you and you have to move on if you want to progress but i feel very proud that we actually served in singapore for 24 years and we have left a pretty reasonable legacy for you so you've got something there that you don't know a fraction of what is there how powerful it is for you it's got that much history for you people and that's where people like Mr. Mok Lai Ying can come in because he can, if you've got a project on, it's of every possibility that goes, your project goes back to the 50s or something like that, that he might be able to pick up and say, yep, we want this for all week. And then from that, you can divulge an awful lot. It's that much information wrapped up in these old photographs because architects, designers, People, botanists, and goodness knows what else, etc. There's something in there for all of them. It's not just the projects like Bucket Brown and a few others, etc. There's a whole host of them out there. So I'm very, very proud that I was able to serve on 81 Squadron and leave, uh, do a little bit toward leaving that, that uh, legacy for you. I don't care about the satellites, they're <laughs> toys. <laughs> um, during your time, was there already a stereoscopic photography already? Just one second, I can't quite hear you. Um, this is the problem we're having worked on aircraft engines where they're going at very high revs and you, 
your, your hearing goes. Carry on. At your time, yeah. was there already a stereoscopic aerial photograph? Was there already serious? Stereo, stereograph, uh, stereo, stereoscopic. Negatives? You know, like uh, two oh, lenses? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were doing 3Ds. They had, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's already. How they, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, during the Second World War, that's how the, that's how the, um, the Royal Air Force intelligence people found out about an awful lot of what was going on in Germany that the Germans didn't even know that we knew about. Oh. Yeah, that was that photograph. Now, that's the difference between mapping and intelligence. And a lot of what Lai Ying is doing now, he's doing mapping, but he's also doing a lot of intelligence. Like, he was doing intelligence work, believe it or not, with that Bukit Brown project. He was divulging. He was pulling out of that, that much information that people were able to reconnect with their relatives, their relations. So that's the difference between mapping and intelligence. He now knows what intelligence is. Thank you. Were there any national service airmen in your oh, squadron? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. It was a mixture of national service yeah, and... Yeah, because I, I remember in 1957, yes. there was national service throughout yes, England. Yes, yes, Because uh, I was in the FCU, and, well, I, and there were a few national service from yeah. the REV. Yeah. Well, how, how long were you in the REV? I was in there for five years. Five years, yeah. huh? But if you went in the National Service, it was potluck what you actually did. That's and right. I was determined I wanted to get an aircraft and work on an aircraft then, so I signed on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And you've got a gentleman here, Eddie, who actually served on 81 Squadron in the Royal Air Force. I'm quite interested when you're talking about the aircraft mounting the cameras. As uh, you mentioned, there are some positions where you have oblique camera and also the uh, vertical and the other cameras yeah. mounted. Yeah. So, can we roughly know normally how many cameras they mount on the aircraft when it's fly for aerial photography? Yeah. I understand uh, there is a vertical camera where you can go in the front and the oblique you can go at the two sides, yeah. is what you say, and the aircraft will go on the ground. Mm. Because I, I came in tonight with uh, my friend uh, Shona because her father was a flight sergeant working in the uh, RF Slater. He's a flight sergeant yeah. during the year 1960s. I was with them working in the CPRU, RF Slater, oh, on this type of the, uh, photography process. So it gave me a memory back that 55 years. That's the reason I came here to listen, to take a knowledge from you, to memorize what was done before. So, I think our friend here just now, uh, what's her name? Uh, oh, Yen, 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 Yen Yuna. Yeah. Oh, Yen Yuna. Uh, she was asking about the sharpness of the film. Yeah. You know? So, I can roughly let her know it is not a normal type of film. It is an aerographic film, which is uh, nine inches width. If you are not mistaken, I think it's 390 feet for one camera film. Yeah. Well, the only I, I, I think so. The only difference between the, the films that you used in your normal camera mm. and the films that were used in correct, these was correct. they were, they yes. were a, a, a yeah. higher, slightly higher quality, but they were all emulsion films. Right, right, the right. difference was that the format would be probably about... Nine, nine, inches, nine inches. Nine inches. The format is 9 inches by 390 feet mm. per row because we are doing the processing in the machine yeah. after the yeah. 81 squadron. Yeah. You know, been filming. Yeah. So, I, I, I'm not very sure how many cameras they mounted, but I can remember it's about 16 cameras. Yeah. Is that correct? Thank no, you. No, there wasn't 16. No, yeah. no, no. no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no there was, I, I think roughly. In, in the Mosquito, there was, um, there was probably four cameras in the back. Could be five, um, depending on the size of them, etc., and the and the mixture. But they all overlapped so that you could get those 3D effects when you actually looked at the pictures. Yeah. 